So live from Pahrump, Valley of the Dirt People, this is Tech Talk Taco Tuesday, edition number 70. Who can believe we've been doing this 70 times? I just heard that yesterday. Um, I'm sitting here with, uh, well, Logan grew up quickly, but (laughs) it's not Logan. It's uh, Mike Shirley. Welcome to Tech Talk Taco Tuesday. And try not to make little extra noises with all the toys that you have in front of you. Don't fidget. Yeah, that's good because it, it's there's it. sound is kind of important uh, to what we're doing here. Mm-hmm. Everybody in the in the chat in the chat room and stuff, how is the sound? Is the sound uh, pretty good? Because we're doing some new stuff. We have broken equipment and we're using uh, different microphones. Especially, let me know if there's some sort of strange echo because that never sounds good on the show, right, Mike? No one likes an echo. No one likes an echo. Yeah. So you you kind of want to sort of talk a little bit into the microphone. That's where you have to play with it a little bit. Have, over here. So if I'm looking at you, admiring you, I'm still oh, yeah, microphone that, centered. That, that works good. I, I yeah. have to keep moving mine around because I start fidgeting as well. Um, the uh, So Mike is a lifelong motorcyclist. Not really. Okay. Um, you got 10 years, though. Uh, about f- uh, About 15 now. 15. Mike yeah. started riding a little bit late, but where Mike really comes into my motorcycle uh, realm is he has something called Rally Navigator, which is software that allows ordinary humans to make map books for rally stuff, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, So, and we use it kind of uh, extensively when we do a lot of training. Um, we use a couple different ones, but lately I've, uh, I've come back around to Rally Navigator because... I was uh, I was forced into it. It's like switching between a PC and a Mac. You know, you you go from one, which is Tulip, which is one we use, and then I go over to Rally Navigator, and because some of the other stuff that we use, they don't talk to each other. Yeah. Well, six months from now, you go back to Tulip, and you'll be back to Navigator. Yeah. Next summer. So but it's for, all good. I, I think for regular people, Rally Navigator is a easier to get your hands on. Yeah. And and I think in reality, it has it has a lot more functionality for I and I, I hate to say this, we we jokingly go, well, that's like a dual sport rally because the rallies that, that we train with and do, nobody nobody wants to do those kind of rallies because they're super technical. They're like racing. It's racing rallies and they're meant to screw with you not to be fun. I, well, I guess they're fun. It yeah, curve balls. Yeah, where your level's at. So, no, for that, um, Rally Navigator works excellent and uh, glad, to, glad to have you, glad to use it. Um, and uh, there's, there's a Heather's favorite person that's not a person. Yeah, we got we got something for you. If you. So if you hear something fidgeting around, it's not me or Mike. We'll it, just let her real professional let her cruise around the table. Right. This for a is while. this is Chai Dog. This is uh, a new. Wow, you're being friendly with me. Do not step on the keyboard. Yeah, you're, the you're really going to step on the keyboard, aren't you? Let's just put her right up. Yeah, yeah. You stay there. Just uh, you just know, here, off camera. Put, but, put your uh, legs up like that. Yeah, so she can pretend to be Logan. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, speaking of that, I'm gonna I'm gonna do something right now. I'm gonna I'm gonna give Logan a call. And see if he can, if he's gonna, if he did his homework assignment, which was our read. Um, we have a few sponsors of this show. Uh, I will tell you about uh, Recluse. Um, Recluse clutches, they make excellent clutching performance, most famous for their auto clutches, which uh, you ever use a Recluse, Mike? Uh, just briefly. Yeah, yeah, I liked it. Oh, you did? Yeah. You're sure? You're yeah, not just, just, it was in your bike. You're not just saying it. I think I drove around like the motorhome in the back here, but uh, I dug it. And uh, yeah, so most people say that haven't used it too much. They say they don't like them, but that's that's why they don't like them. Is having used. So Logan, how you doing? Good. Do you uh, are you are you ready? Yeah. You got your radio announcer voice on. Um. Sure. Okay. So uh, the important part here is, uh, uh, you, did you write it down? Or are you going to do it off the top of your head? I wrote it down. Oh, <laughs> smart boy. Smart yeah, boy. that's that's prep. This okay, is, this is pro. So, Logan, what what are what are we talking about here? KTM's. Yes. And what do you have to say about KTM? Um, they're powered by a distinct ready to run mentality. KTM is the world's leading high performance street and off road sport motorcycle manufacturer, with North American. Headquarters based in Marietta, California. Over the years, KTM has built a 
reputation as a fierce, com- fierce competitor on the racetrack around the world, and the brand's remarkable global success is reflected in every product that develops and every move it makes. Wow. I think you nailed it. Yeah. yeah that, was pretty, that was pretty good, Logan. Yeah. I mean, except it sounds like your sister's screaming in the background, there's dogs barking, and the wind's blowing. When are you going to be yeah. back? Um, Sunday. Sunday. Okay. You missing you missing uh, Tech Talk Taco Tuesday? Yes. Oh, I thought you were going to say not really, but uh, with, <laughs> with 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 that, uh, thanks, and we might call you at the end of the show, but I'm going to hang up on you. Good job, Logan. Okay. Okay. See ya. See ya. <laughs> uh, I think you nailed it. Good. Yeah, it's the best I've heard so far. That's he's he, he got it. He got at least a B plus in that one. Yeah, he's if, you, if he would have if he would have just lied to me and said no, I'm not reading it, and just pulled that. <laughs> I mean, how are we going to tell? That's right? a real deal right yeah. there. Yeah. <laughs> So, Mike, um, <laughs> since you're standing in for Logan, uh, you're, yeah. one of your main jobs is every once in a while I get thirsty and I'd like to take a sip of something, and that's when you talk. Like, Logan doesn't oh. talk much, uh, but he's kind of like, learn, learn that. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's why I like a, a co-host that doesn't say much. Unless you want to talk about me, then it's wide open just anytime. Uh, you can. I'm with the public school in Santa Cruz, California, so I don't, you know, <laughs> I can't put a full sentence together. Interrupt. It's yeah. really tough. Yeah. So, hey, everybody, thanks for joining in on the chat room. Uh, So currently we are live on Facebook. We try to do that every Tuesday night at 7 p.m. That's where you can get your questions answered instantly. Or if you're watching this on the YouTubes, you just uh, make a comment on one of the videos. And generally we pick those. We will pick up the best ones. Um, Those are the ones that usually say, wow, Jimmy, this is the best video I've ever seen. And then I, I absolutely read those every time. Uh, but if you have a you know real solid question about one of the videos uh, about a certain motorcycle or about this show in general, uh, go ahead and ask it. Um, and if you're uh, if you're thinking about getting some climb gear, uh, you should uh, do that because I think uh, Climb is a great sponsor of our show. They make excellent gear, especially the adventure riding gear, uh, especially the uh, the off road focused gear which we wear uh, quite a bit. Um, I wear it when I'm out riding and yeah. Uh, ask a question about climb gear. Cause they, they like hearing your questions uh, cause they, they pay attention to the show because they use it to develop new products and do market research. Kind of like some of the stuff we did with climb show us your junk backpack uh, vest, you know, carrying challenge we had some pretty interesting videos submitted there yeah, and i'll stick it just on climb gear i, I had uh, dinner with those guys a few years ago at the venture rally in colorado and one of the uh, product designers was there uh, and i just met him and he, he was kind of talking a bit about their process and uh, i never really thought about it but you know they have reps from from material reps coming in you know from 3m and different product providers and, and he was telling me he, he asked his product the the sales rep hey bring me anything for like air, you know aerospace military police like bring me like your highest tech materials and he's like i had pants on he's like yeah that's where we got that material and i'm like that's so cool because that material wasn't on my previous pant like some stretchy stuff and it was cool to know that that was coming from like some like you know basically aerospace and a you know fighter pilot background for some of their uh, materials it's and i mean that's true i mean they, they're they're that and sometimes you sit there and go what what makes a company that's like you know leading the the game and some of the things and you see this with other high-end gear manufacturers as well you know they're they're getting their hands on some material that isn't readily available yet or it isn't kind of popular yeah first time i saw it was inclined pants and and it it might especially when you use it when you're the first one to use it it's just like technology it might be a little bit more expensive and stuff but it's such a leap in the way that it allows something to work and then all of a sudden you see it start trickling down or in a lot of cases there's the knockoff fabric the one that Mm -hmm. you know stretches the same but it catches on fire (laughs) so uh it's it's all a trade-off i guess yeah save a few bucks but right you're on fire so, uh, yeah, uh, thanks to everybody for uh, uh, sponsoring it. This is, a, this is the bald edition of uh, Tech Talk Taco Tuesday, Mike. Do you, <laughs> do you, do you, do you see the, the people that are jealous of our it's lack of... the only reason of, I got invited is my hair's falling out. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's, it's what Logan's going to look like <laughs> in 20 years. Yeah. Uh, well, maybe. I don't know. That kid's probably going to have a full head of hair, and he's going to laugh at me <laughs> when he's my age. Uh, let's see. Love the disembodied voice from the ether. What does that mean, Martin? <laughs> oh, wait. I think he's on ether. I, I think Martin, he might be uh, getting modified. Like, he wouldn't be talking if he was on ether. Oh, really? Yeah. Because I, I think I saw, I think I think I saw a picture on the internets of him. It looked like he might have been in one of those gowns they give you in the uh, 
in the hospital. Um, let's see. What else do we have going in here? Um, your mic doesn't sound like it's on. Todd Kelly. Uh, my mic. Talking to me. Hello, Todd. Yeah. Who's Mike? <laughs> Mike, 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 Mike. Who's Mike? My mic, I could maybe adjust that way. Boy, if it's not on, I'm going to have to do a lot of audio engineering that I'm definitely not very yeah. capable of doing. It. Um, let's see. The guy who helps with helmet and heat control is pretty awesome, I hear. Yeah, Martin's on the ether. <laughs> Martin helps with helmets, basically, you know, a lot of other stuff, too. But he, he always tells them, like, why do you keep making these damn black helmets? Because they look good and they work good for, like... 80% of the people during 60% of the year, if you know what I mean, mm -hmm. like the cooler months. And yeah. I'm the guy that's wearing my black helmet when it's 110 it's degrees out. And uh, I like to say they're so good. They're so vented that when you do, when it does heat up and you do sweat a little bit, it actually, mm. you know, it, it does its, it does its deal, but it still get some air flowing through. Yeah. yeah. A white helmet would probably be much better for most people. Actually, I probably should wear a white helmet too. Cause one of these days I'm going to have my black helmet on. It's going to fry the two brain cells I currently have. Mm -hmm. And then we're in trouble. <laughs> yeah, you're already on the borderline right now. Yeah. Um, Steve Conklin just popped up. Uh, let's see. He says, I have been discouraged by many of the garment companies as us older dual sport riders are bigger in the middle and shorter in the legs. Are there plans to expand waist sizes for the use of beer-bellied ADV riders? Uh, it's a market. I, I mean, I tell you what, like climb definitely has some big size. There's a lot of companies that have the big waist sizes, but they tend to have like, they don't do big waist, short legs. Big and tall. Yeah. Yeah. They do big and tall. Like that, like I, a lot of the climb stuff, even for me, cause I have a short, shorter inseam for my waist hasn't started growing. It's just the belly. I still fit in the same size pants as I did when I was in high school. Uh, yeah, they, they, I'm sure they're, you know, if it, and it all comes down to sales, you know, if, if they build that gear and it sells, they make more of it, and if they build it and it doesn't sell, then they make they make yeah, less. less. Um, Bryce Davis says, "I used to think Climb was overpriced. Then I bought some of their pants, and it's been a great value." That's a that's actually a great statement there because there's a lot of that you get what you pay for, and I'm I'm totally guilty of buying a lot of cheap stuff, and. What, we're not looking at any of this equipment on this table, Bob. Don't, don't even, there's <laughs> nothing, nothing cheap here. Everybody's laughing at me. Uh, so I, yeah, I buy cheap things. And then when I buy something that's really good quality, and then I realize, yeah, it has lasted for a long time. And I don't buy my gear. I mean, I get, I'm, I'm given all the different gear, but I can tell you between the different gear companies and stuff like that, uh, there's, there's definitely a difference. I mean, some of it's made to last a season. At most, so with, for me, it lasts, you know, four or five rides. Yeah, and but it, some of that, like uh, typically, like motocross gear, is just a little, like a little lighter, a little lighter material, a thinner material. It seems like I run across that. Where I mean, climb seems it's more like, like you know, an enduro adventure where it's pretty, you know, pretty burly. So it used to be that their stuff was bulky, a little bit heavier and more substantial. But that's where the materials are starting to come in. And mm -hmm. and and not like I said, not all motocross gear is created the same. And there's there's some gear companies that make really high end uh, moto gear that's that's expensive, and I'm really surprised at how it lasts because I don't it's still durable like lightweight and durable. Yeah, I I always well here's my problem I always forget to order new motocross gear and we go out and do a, a photo shoot and it's like well I end up wearing last year's gear and maybe it's a little bit less than you know longer than last year's gear mm. and I have some stuff that I've been wearing for two and three years now and and I don't just wear it because I don't necessarily wear climb when I go to the track mm -hmm. it's just kind of a it's a goofy style thing I don't know what it is um uh and so I've have I've had gears for two and three years. Some of it lasts, and some of it, like I said, four years, which is maybe you know, I mean, four rides, which is <laughs> like <laughs> you know, a lot more than. And all of a sudden, the seams are busting out on some of the pants and mm -hmm. things like that. Jerseys tend to you know handle the same. But um, okay, uh, buy once, cry once. That's what George says. Oh, spend the money once, you'll cry, but it'll last longer. Yeah. Well, anyways. Um, uh, Christian Parker has a an entire closet full of climb. It lasts forever. 
and you pay for that quality. Yeah. Uh, I thought Chris and Parker, knowing Chris, uh, that's Chris from Rottweiler Performance, who makes okay. the same level of quality parts for KTM bikes. Dude, I've got on my 990. Um, yeah. Uh, I thought he was going to like put it up for sale right away. <laughs> <laughs> on the, he's, he's selling. He's, he's selling a lot of Honda parts. He had. He had. He got all the stuff from Baja. He was going to build a Honda bike. He's probably selling all the Honda parts right now. So, um, okay, guys, uh, let's roll right into our our questions um, that this we got from. The, that's your job. Yeah. So what's our? So I usually put the name. You don't have to tell, tell us when we got the uh, thing, but then just uh, fire away and start asking the okay. question. Yeah, I got a short question, then the next one's about two and a half pages. So yeah, let's start with the. Yeah, let's just I, let's simple. go in order. Alrighty, uh, Mason McNeil. Uh, Wrote to you uh, questions. Uh, so I put a 48 tooth uh, Renthal twin ring rear sprocket on my bike, and I was about to snap the throttle off. Had it pinned, uh, topped out at 85. Now I'm wondering what's wrong with my bike. Maybe clutch slipping. So uh, Mason is talking about a uh, new version Honda Sierra 450X, and he saw this video I did uh, where I just held my phone up over the odometer while i pinned it and went down a road and it got going like 96 mm. and this was the bike i rode away from the intro when i was riding away from the intro because i rode from where the intro was up to um a, a cabin i had up in the mountains and i just wanted to put mm. some time on it and uh i got the box stock sierra 450x going 96 miles an hour so he says his is going 65 so, 85. Oh, 85. Okay, that's some context. I didn't know the whole uh, back oh, story there. But is it 80, uh, yeah. Is it, what is, is it so 80? He put a 48 tooth uh, sprocket on. His bike's topped out at 85 miles Oh, 85 an hour. miles an hour. Okay. Um, so so I thought he said 65 or maybe. I might have said 25. I don't even know. <laughs> How many is that? I have no idea. Um, uh, tonight's uh, Tech Talk Taco Tuesday, we're going to have Loma Azul Tequila again because I never put it away from last time, and it's uh, right here. So while I'm answering this question, Mike, mm-hmm. since we're talking about top speed, you know, Two adult hosts, we can do this properly. Thanks, Logan, for uh, being on vacation. Um, back to the Honda question. The So I went back and I said, okay, uh, doesn't matter what brand of sprocket it is. We're just spinning circles here. Um, man, you pour those things like Johnny Campbell. <laughs> we, had jo- we had Johnny on the show, and, he, and it wasn't cheap tequila either. It was some really expensive stuff, and he we had bigger glasses. That's why I started going to the small ones. Um, so uh, th- the size of the sprocket for sure, because I think stock is forty nine, and you went down to forty eight. If I and I'm going off of just my memory, mm-hmm. uh, but so I asked him, was there wind? Uh, was the, what was the, you know, what tire or we on gravel or Alt- dirt altitude. and all this other stuff. So when I did that video, I was, I was on pavement and, um, uh, you know, just a paved road. That's, uh, really not even a, really a road. Cause it, I wouldn't want to break any laws. So I was going down a paved road and it was completely level and there was no wind. And so he said, he came back and said, no wind, uh, gravel road. Mm-hmm. And then he said Dunlop AT81, which I think is the stock tire. I'm pretty sure. And, uh, and then, but he's worried about his clutch slipping and why it wouldn't go 96 miles an hour. And I was on pavement and he was on dirt. That is the difference right there. And his tire is probably spinning. So I would actually dig deeper and go, okay, Mason, what do you weigh? And and he's probably thinking that's a mean question, but if you're heavier, you're going to go faster because you're going to get better traction, which I always piss me off when we do top speeds, uh, testing like with Danny Hamill and, and, uh, Danny could always go like three or four miles an hour faster than me, um, whether it was a dry lake bed or you know, it was more it was more so on the dry lake bed where we test. But on the pavement, whenever they pull the radar gun, Danny is always faster. And I mean, yeah, he was faster, of course, but he was faster. And I, I did all my tucking and all my stuff. And, and it went to like it just had to do with weight or the fact that he was just a more aerodynamic uh, shape mm-hmm. <laughs> when he was on the when he was on the motorcycle. But, uh, or he just, he, You're like, more like, like pear, he talked about, shape, he so talked about stretching the throttle cable. Maybe Danny just stretched the throttle cable farther than me. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Uh, but, um, I, it's, it all comes down to traction at that point. And if it's going 85, um, and mine was going 96, that's probably a lot of spinning. But what I wanted to get deeper since you brought the clutch and then he talked about his clutch and he said there was an eighth of an inch of basically he was describing the play in his, the free play in his lever, which is really good on that bike. It's important to have some free play in your, in your lever because if it's tight 
and it starts slipping, it's only going to get tighter. It's partially, engaged, it, it, it'll, right? it'll it'll start. It'll make it start slipping, gotcha. and as it slips, it'll heat up and it'll slip more. And it depends on the the activation of your clutch. You know, some some clutches get loose when they get hot. The Honda gets tight when it gets hot, which is kind of a bad thing. Um, if you allow it to get tight, so I got stereos going by. I wonder if you, you can hear that in the microphone, can't you? Yeah, I wasn't sure what that was. Yeah, so. and the, we right. usually have the wheelie boys ripping up and down the street, and that uh, affects the sound quality. Now we got people with bigger stereos than me. Uh, so, so if if it and here's so here's the question you ask of it: if the clutch is slipping, it's possible, but there's a real easy way to tell. And what I tell people to do is to is to find a really good traction surface like pavement and and put a really good load so you know get it to where it's going and then drag the rear brake so do not touch the clutch just drag the rear brake and as you drag the rear brake if it bogs the motor down you know quite a bit and it the you know you and you keep pushing on the brake more and more and it bogs it down to where it's going to stall or you're not not totally where it's going to stall but it brings it down your clutch is good but if you're riding along and you and you, you drag your rear brake and you push more and you notice that the the motor doesn't bog down yeah, your clutch is could... your clutch is slipping gosh okay just put, just put more resistance on the clutch yeah. and it's and and, up. and, okay. and so i i i mostly notice this with guys on on cable actuated adventure bikes that are having a hard time with their clutch cuz they're they're slipping they're basically trying to take a motor that's making at the time 30 or 40 horsepower and they're trying to reduce it down to like 5 or 6 mm -hmm. cuz that's all they really needed so they they turn the throttle too much and start slipping the clutch or pumping the clutch or whatever. And the, the clutch heats up and they go, it's my clutch fried. So I hop in their bike and this is what I do. I hop in their bike and I can do it on dirt because I, I know that once I start loading the brake, it doesn't, the traction doesn't matter too much anymore because the brake is what's determining. And then, and then I just start riding the brake and I, you know, I got the bike, no clutch, the clutch is completely disengaged. And I start just dragging the brake and lifting it up and dragging the brake and lifting it up. And that's going to determine the tone of the motor. If when I drag the brake, it doesn't affect the tone of the motor, the pull of the motor, mm -hmm. the right amount, then I know the clutch is slipping. And if I really want to test it, then I'm dragging the brake and then I touch the clutch a little bit. And if the, when you touch the clutch, if it revs up and you let go of the clutch and it drops right back down, guess what? Clutch is good. Gotcha. If you, if you touch the clutch and this is, you're still not in the super danger zone with the clutch. If you're dragging, you touch the clutch and it revs up. And then it, it takes a long time to bog right down. It doesn't bog right down. Getting getting worse. You know the plate the plates I'll call them glazed. Okay. They're they're not fried yet. They're glazed because mm -hmm. it doesn't want to. You know when you let it back out, it takes a while for it to settle back in. So it's barely gripping instead of yeah. So you know. that's how you test the clutch. If you if you're worried if your clutch is slipping, let go of it. You know get it going. Let go of it. Hold the throttle on. Drag the brakes, and if if that doesn't if that doesn't bog the motor down, you're having gotcha. an issue. Um, how how would you? Uh, oh, just grab just why does a peanut gallery. Why yeah. does he want to go 92 miles an hour? Because you want to know how fast your bike goes, Bob. That's all we do. Have you ever have you ever seen my episodes of I've Got You in My Pocket on on Instagram? It's what all the kids were into about three or four or five seven years ago. Well, they're all going to come back because TikTok's bad now. Yeah, so, but um, everybody wants to go that fast. Oh. Yeah, yeah, it's good It's uh, good for you. I got a question on that one. Right. Uh, altitude. What do you, you're doing that out your backyard here. At 2,600 feet, and I did that other test at uh, 3,500 is where I got 96. Um, uh, but um, so how, how big a, you know, if you went up to 5,000, 6,000, how would you? Altitude affects it uh, a little bit, but not. It's, I mean, because it's engine in, power. Yeah, since it's fuel injected, as you go up, you're going to lose a little bit. But I don't really know the. I'm sure there's people that are way smarter than me that can okay. factor in the altitude correction. Okay, that was just the first thing that jumped my mind was because yeah. I mean, I'm in Reno, I'm at five thousand feet. Yeah, it shouldn't affect it by. It shouldn't affect it that much, but the air gets thinner, and then there's less air pushing against you, right, Bob? Yeah, but you're also way down on power. Way down on power. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, who who was giving us our formulas for? Um, what was his name? Uh, 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 Todd uh, was is that a oh, that the swing arm guy? The swing arm guy. Uh, call him right le now. Lead la land. I hey, and people think I just butcher the names when I have to read them. <laughs> la la that he'll 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 probably well he's robotics so we need an aerodynamicist Bob aerodynamicist Hook get somebody up. to figure it out. Hook it up. Yeah. 
<laughs> Someone's got to know somebody. Uh, okay. So, um, Mason, hopefully I answered your question. I think your bike's fine. Uh, I would, if you have the opportunity to be able to try it on a better traction situation, be careful with that. Because I think your, your microphone is right there, Mike. Oh. You're scratching, you're scratching your microphone with the. Got a whole separate microphone. Yeah. We're, we're on a different program today. This is all new. Okay. So my fidgeting has been like right there. <laughs> okay. I'm done. I know. Uh, I'll okay. sit on my hands. So, yeah. You sound good in this, which is the going to be the podcast mm-hmm. audio, which is the important part. Okay, good. So uh, that's where your fans all around the world congregate around the radio with their family and just you know. Yeah, like the old learn. days. Hey, Bob, go out and tell uh, Erica she can come in and visit us at the uh, Tech Talk Taco Tuesday. You want to hit this? Uh, well, somebody's got to talk because it's. Doing the whole, well, not if you sign the whole thing. Uh, cheers! Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Oh, that's sipping tequila, by the way. No. Um, I had a couple of too many at the cabin, and I had to put myself to bed at 9 o'clock. The Fortaleza was really good tequila, yeah, by good. the way, um, if you're into into good tequila. Um, so uh, the next – I don't see any new ones in the chat room. What is our next question? Let me, okay, so we're moving on to the, the question. That's the long one? This, this is the long one. Okay. This could be the toughest question in Toughest tech question of the night. <laughs> tech talk in history. Uh, can Am Dennis 68 writes, um, hey, I have one for you guys. Uh, why has my Yam- or why has Yamaha quit making the WR250R for 2021? Oh, that's a quick one. I reached out. Who asked that question? Uh, can Am Dennis. Can Am Dennis. Uh, I reached out and asked Yamaha for that, and mm-hmm. their media representative is on vacation. <laughs> so uh, I, I can't get the uh, straight later. answer to that. I. I didn't know that they were making that they'd stop making that bike. So that is the kind of the dual sporty street version WR. It's not the, mm-hmm. it's not the. That's the problem is Yamaha has to. I got mad when Honda renamed all their bikes CRFs mm-hmm. because I liked XR and I liked, but I knew what it was. But Yamaha has two different WRs, and one's quote a street bike, and one is an off road bike, okay. but they're still called WR. So. I just wanted her up, up in the front, not to make. T- She's like a tap dancer on the on the, the microphones. Well, I didn't want to drop you on the floor. Uh, so, okay. There you now, go, Heather. You saw the dog. Yeah. That was her big reveal right there. <laughs> <laughs> the next the next question. Okay, I'll finish that one up. Uh, so, uh, Yamaha, quit that. So, oh, that's actually his, his question one is actually his question number two. So, three Oh, there. no. Actually, I think somehow or another, um, oh, his name is at the very end of the question. See, you got formatting issues going on here. For a guest speaker, it's pretty tricky to navigate. Everybody, everybody really doesn't understand how difficult your job really is. I know. You, you, I know you got your own system. You're a pro. So, <laughs> At um, what? Uh, media. <laughs> Not this. <laughs> Something else. Uh, are you offering classes this fall? Yes. Okay. We, we, we are in the process of... Uh, making sure that happens but we're just have to abide by all the new regulations and rules and find out what we're allowed to do and yeah we're going to be having some uh schools okay cool uh rest of the question is uh, i'm just now catching up to the episodes that occurred since covid so maybe you've discussed this i think we just did uh, i'm definitely going to sign up uh, i've taken classes from shane watts uh gary laplante uh, i want to learn more i also bought an older adv bike so excited to work on skills in both areas let me know if you have anything for dates uh, what do you got? What's coming up? Uh, so we don't have any announced dates, but the best thing always to do, I tell people, just sign up for our newsletter, and then you will know when we announce it. You'll know right away and uh, be able to do stuff. So yeah, yeah, I want to actually get down as you guys get going. I've, I've you know ridden a bunch of miles, but it's just me out by myself, bumbling around, and uh, never had any formal instruction. And uh, you know, formal instruction goes a long way. It does, and that some people just don't like doing that, and and other people would like really enjoy training and learning that kind of stuff. So yeah, we'll have schools again, and uh, uh, another. And when I start breaking into telling you how to ride, when you're asking me a question about your bike, and I just trip off the deep end, and I'm like, well, it's the way you ride, kind of like we were talking about how people on adventure bikes take 45 horsepower and turn it down into like five with their clutch. <laughs> they're just, I think, what they're trying to do is just generate heat. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So keep okay. your legs warm. Uh, this portion of this show is brought to you by Jimmy Lewis Off Road Training. Uh, you can check us out on the web at www.jimmylewisoffroad.com for our newly designed uh, website. And we're going to be having schools up in Washington, Washington State, before we have schools down here in Nevada. So just uh, sign up for that newsletter. 
Continue. I'm, well, I'm still trying to figure out where question one ends and where question two <laughs> begins because it's it's really confusing. Uh, I remember Help the guy. Me, I, master. I remember the question. I remember the guy's name. Um, question one. It's all his bike info. Oh yeah. So on, so this is. I get the bottom page two. Wow. Sure. I know this is. His name is Ben Anderson, by the way. Wow, that's a page and a half long question. Oh, ben, no, Ben's at the end. Okay. Yeah. So that's Ben Anderson. Uh, Mason's at the top. Asks, uh, oh, he's going to give you all of his uh, all of his stats. Um, he's another guy. He's claiming that he's shorter than seam for his height, long torso, and arms. So uh, just if you're a gear manufacturer, uh, there's another one. Maybe just short, larger people listen to this show. Maybe it's a big market. And obviously bald people don't listen to it because they wouldn't be picking on us. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, his goal is to be a strong rider in crazy tight single track mountains and uh, enter some local enduros and hair scrambles. Right now, I ride trails in central Washington. And uh, yeah, he says he has a, uh, he wanted a 790, a KTM 790, but he's just getting into ADV. So he purchased a 2010 F800 GS. Remember that bike I was talking about where the riders slip the clutch all the time and they asked me if it's slipping? Yeah. Yeah. That bike. That's it. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, well, we're still talking about riding habits and stuff. Um, he's talking about his WR450 that he said it was a lot of bike for him. And then he realized he needed some better skills. And then when the 350 came out, he bought one and he has the uh, 2016 FE350. And he said he had a terrible time getting accustomed to that bike. I assumed it was just Euro versus Japanese frame geometry and poor riding position. I've learned to ride much further forward on the bike, which has helped a ton. Eventually had the suspension done and bought a cheater tire, and that helped a lot too. For a while. He says, I stand as much as possible, 80% of the time, so now that is about where I am standing. There is nothing wrong with the bike. It is mostly me. Here we go. Here's the question. Dive into the question. You found it. Recently, though, I checked the sag and it was off by 36 millimeters, probably due to some weight gain. So here's where we have to do the math. And if it's 36 millimeters and he's calling weight gain, I think he's 36 millimeters too deep into the stroke. So too much. So instead of being around 105, he's at 145. That's just rough math doing it in my head. And I'm hoping I'm going the right direction because if it's the other direction, I'm suspecting his spring was completely topped out. But anyhow, so... Uh, probably due to some weight gain in the additional, uh, of huge Vesto tools, which I'm now reconsidering probably cause you watched uh, show climb your junk and realized you don't have to carry that much stuff. Mm -hmm. So I'll need a heavier spring and probably a full service on the forks because it's been three years. Uh, the shock more than the forks that there's just think about how much fluids inside there and how much heat it's contained in. So yeah, if you're going to have, do your suspension, uh, do fork and shocks, have them service back to his question. Everyone complains about the four CS fork, but to be honest, I can't tell if they're good or bad or need adjusting. Not sure since any service would help. I'm mostly concerned about the sag at the moment. Also have decided to add a recluse. Okay. Now we're just going off in left field. Here's another one of my pet peeves. One modification at a time. <laughs> a recluse, great idea. No problem adding the recluse. I have one on almost every one of my personal bikes. Back to the question. I love using my clutch, but occasionally I stall on steep downhills and an unexpected switchback. So I figure the recluse would save me in those situations and otherwise I can ignore it. That's question one. <laughs> so this, this is why I didn't have to put a whole lot of questions. I, we're we're going to break this down. I'm going to break it down. Drop it. Um, so I'm glad he measured, finally measured his sack because the first thing you should always do on your bike when you when you start feeling like there's a handling issue, and you, handling issue is make sure your sag is where it's supposed to be. And sag will tell you, for the most part, whether you have the proper spring on the back of the bike. Uh, if, you, if you can't get a proper... What we call it a, a static sag and then rider sag, so sag of just the bike, which is usually about thirty millimeters, thirty to forty millimeters, and then you should sit on it. It should be about a hundred to one hundred and ten. So you're in that in those two ranges. You on the bike, hundred and ten, hundred and five, somewhere there. You off the bike, thirty five to forty. 
He's on a linkage bike. He's on a linkage bike. Doesn't matter. Same thing. It's if you're, we're just being general here. Okay. So, um, a linkage bike maybe a little. It sags a little bit more. So it'd be more like and forty-five. Manual. And the owner's manual will tell exactly yeah. what your sag and your static sag and sag should be. Um, so it's good that he found that when you're down an extra. 30 millimeters that's way way off that's to the point where i'm unscrewing the shock spring so i can put my feet on the ground and then we have a rider problem oh you know it's like you don't ride with your feet on the ground it shouldn't be a concern we need to think about something else because you're really making the bike handle funny if it's down that low i don't care how far over the front of the bike you get you're probably not gonna get it bring that back And if you're if you're if you're compensating with your body position for that amount of sag, you're definitely putting too much weight on your handlebars, and you're probably having to do a push up on the handlebars, which is different than the way most people ride because most people are hanging on to the handlebars as opposed to pushing down on them when they ride. They mm-hmm. they they're hanging on, but oh, they're, they're I, too far back. And you want to know what my super? I never tell anybody this, but it's super top secret. You want you want to know this, this is the place to keep secrets, yeah. Right. For it. Because nobody listens. Like uh-huh. three people listen it's to the show. It's just Jimmy and I here. It's just Jimmy and Bob and Erica just showed up. Yeah. Hi Erica. Hello, Erica. Yeah. Another That's another fun. person in the peanut gal. You're free to ask questions, by the way. So mm-hmm. here's the here's the thing you need to know if you want to know if you're doing it right when you're riding. You want to know what you have to ask yourself? Can I let go of the handlebars? And if the answer is no, you're not in the right riding position. You're not in the proper body position. That's that's it. Are, are there situations where that, I mean, picturing riding that holds true most of the time. Are there situations where you think, no, this doesn't apply now. I should I should have a chunk of control on the bars that's like sort of out of balance. In in my very idealized way of teaching, um, you 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 steer the motorcycle with your feet and and you're turning and controlling it. You're basically initiating turns. You're, you're, you're getting it to lean and steer where you want it to go mm-hmm. by your weight bias, how you're moving the bike around using your weight influence through the foot pegs. And then magically the handlebars will do what they need to do. They mm-hmm. will magically steer. So if you have to push and pull and twist on the handlebars, you're compensating for something that's wrong. A very, very idealized way of thinking about it, but this yeah. is, this is the way so you can break it down what you're doing. So, if you're putting energy into the handlebars, if you're twisting or pulling or doing something like that, you're you're giving away an an extra added control that you could put in when you really need to. So if you want to correct something, you can you can do that, but you don't want to constantly be correcting through the handlebars the whole mm-hmm. time you're riding, which is what most riders do. When so so if you're riding and you're putting this 30% weight bias up onto the handlebars, you're giving away 30% extra control that you could use when you really need it to recontrol gotcha. the bike. So if, if that bike is that out of balance and you're compensating with your body position and I would, I would be willing to bet more money than I can afford to lose. Thanks Martin. Um, that he is not really standing up. He's doing some sort of controlled squat and then, and then mm-hmm. hovering or or doing a push up or a pull up or whatever on the handlebar. Mm-hmm. So that's just a that's just a guess because I see it a lot of times. So the sag has thrown everything out the window. So you can't even say European versus Japanese handling. There's none of that. I will tell you that the KTM's tend to have a lighter steering feel and a more um, uh, I would I want to call it. I don't want to call it precise because that's that would be taken away from some bikes that have a different sort of precision feel. Um, it's probably the I would say some of the they they have some of the lightest steering feel of all the bikes that I've ridden. Especially if your sag is thirty six millimeters too low, mm-hmm. it would get extremely light because you're just taking weight off of it. But then the funny thing is, is at that point you're getting the bike to squat back down and you're you're kind of kicking out the the rake. Mm-hmm. And so then all of a sudden some of that stuff that used to be precision steering is now lazy, non-responsive. Because of like the, the chopper. Yeah, yeah you, you get sort of the chopper effect and then it also it also really stretches out the trail. You know, when the, when all of a sudden the forks start angling back and mm-hmm. you know the, the angle of the trail okay. and then the way that the bike flops instead of steering on steering on the bottom of the tire, you're steering on the back of the tire. Mm-hmm. So that's why sometimes it helps for stability, you know, to, to lower the bike a little bit, but maybe not necessarily that much. Like an inch and a half. So, so uh 
hopefully that uh, 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 Ben, Ben, yeah, a, hopefully yeah. Ben that answered the question phase one. Uh, recluse clutch always a good idea. Um, so can't really uh, uh, talk to you about that. Other than when you talk about the stalling and stuff like that, um, most of that will go away with a recluse because all of a sudden um, it does all that stuff for you. And just uh, watch some of the videos we have on setting up recluse clutches on dirt bike test. And and so when you get it, you can tune in to, you know, how to get it properly set up for your for your riding conditions. So did I do good? I think you did. You found the questions. Did better not do it. Okay. So next question. It, it's a two-part question. If he's, if he's stalling when he's going downhill, is he just locking up the rear? Is that it? Could be. We don't know. We weren't there. Uh, but um, he's if if he, you can lock up the rear all day as long as you make sure that you're covering the clutch and you're you know not letting it stall. But you think about it, and here's here's the problem. It's probably eighty percent of that having that ability to control the bike, the 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 finger on the clutch and the. And the you know controlling the rear brake, and then you're doing some sort of kind of strange controlled squat on the motorcycle. You, you know, since you're not balanced on your own motorcycle, uh, it's difficult. You know, think about think about like trying to lift some dumbbells. You own a gym. Think about the trying to too, yeah yeah tr- trying to trying to uh, trying to you know pull the dumbbell and then and then work a clutch and lift the dumbbell with your foot and push the brake. You know, mm-hmm. when and then being a little bit out of balance, it's just it's hard. Yeah. So the more balanced you are on the bike and and everything, it makes it it makes it easier. And another question. Yeah. Do you remember when the high performance four strokes first came? High out? performance four strokes. Yep. The moto had started riding them, and they wouldn't finish a moto because they had no clutch left because they rode it like a two stroke. Yeah, they were slipping they the clutch all the time. Like yeah, yeah. It's it, the people just don't trust the torque of the bikes, or you know, I I think a lot of that was um, the. In the early days, the carburetors are so bad uh, that they stalled. So they were really they didn't want them to stall because they also didn't start. So they were just oh, really God. they they wouldn't they wouldn't let them idle down. Just revving the whole time. Yeah, they're just like revving and slipping the clutch, and so they were reducing the power with the clutch, which is another thing that you shouldn't do. So, okay, on um, to the next question. Uh, or, or, oh, what, here we go. What, what year did high performance four strokes come out? That was man. Uh, YZ400 was 1998, if I remember correctly. Oh, that's so that's, that's, but, th- but that wasn't, that was kind of the first Japanese one. So you, there's this brand I know a little bit about. You might be familiar with it. You, do you know what I'm going to talk about the white, here? The white, white ones. The, they were blue back then. Oh. Yeah. Kind of like, day, man. Husabergs. Yeah. Yeah. Husabergs. Oh, okay. Uh, and, and then, and then Husabergs and Huskies yeah, Husky. and, and there was, you know, Husky, was started making them before Husaberg because all the guys that made the Husaberg were the guys that made the Husky. So those were the original, you know, lightweight, high performance four strokes. They, they determined in their crazy ass mind, and it was never going to work that they could build a four stroke that was better than a two stroke in 1982, 83. When did that, when did that first impossible start Husky four stroke? Oh yeah, only when it got, yeah. Um, but that's when they started making. You know, they 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 said we can we can do this, and then you know, fifteen years later, it actually since the Japanese company did it, it was proven that it it worked. But okay, they'd already okay. won a world motocross championship on the on the Husky, and they were starting to get very very competitive in enduros. You know, high high level competi- enduro competition. Uh, so, what year was that that the four strokes sort of took over the two strokes for like motocross class? The minute they were introduced, like oh, really? like literally, the minute you could buy a YZ four hundred, a two fifty two stroke was obsolete because the four hundred four stroke, even then, it was so much easier to get a whole shot on it, on get a great start because you didn't have to shift. You know, mm-hmm. you could come off the line smoother, and you didn't have to shift as much down a start straight away. So less shifts equals so you know more on the gas, broader power, yeah, and flat. And, Mm-hmm. Yeah, flat torque curve, and and that was just when they got started. And then when they started releasing two fifty four strokes, they, the minute they did that, the one twenty five was literally dead. I mean, sure, at the top levels, um, you know, the the factory teams were racing one twenty fives and getting away with it. But all of a sudden, you have a bike that makes like thirty percent more power, and it and it delivers power in in probably a forty percent wider RPM range. Mm-hmm. Game over. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah, game over. 
Um, so, do we have a question too? Yeah, sure. Um, all right, this is still uh, going back to Ben Anderson. Question two: um, He's getting ready to get a suspension service, adding a recluse clutch, swapping tires, and getting the bike in for standard servicing. Uh, this is going to cost him between two and three thousand uh, dollars. So his question is: Should I be looking at getting a new bike instead of sinking all that money in my existing bike? That is a really good question. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> so um, his bike is a 2016. Yes. Yes. 2016. Yep. WR450. No, no, no. He's a FE350. Oh, Husky. God. Okay. Sorry. Next slide. Right. So, um, so your bike's not outdated. And I always say every three years on, a, on most, most models, three to four years, uh, especially KTMs, you will notice a marked improvement in the bike. And it's probably stuff that you can't buy. You know, it's it's some chassis uh, changes that you, you can't buy these like, chassis like changes. Moving, moving that back shock mount. Yeah, moving the shock mount or changing the, you know, the frame rails. And it's like, it's funny because now they'll call a bike that looks almost the same. Like the YZ, uh, we just, uh, can we talk about YZ450? No, I can't talk about it yet. <laughs> I can't talk about it till tomorrow. They didn't change much on it, but they can't talk about it till tomorrow. Um, but, uh, when, when manufacturers, you know, they make a lot of changes on it, but it looks the same, but they change the frame, the spars on the frame, or they change the cylinder head and maybe the, the, the length of the connecting rod. I mean, like, and they call those like all new models now. And it's probably not like, you know, when you see one go from a completely different frame design or something, mm -hmm. but every three or so years, if you go from, so if you go from a 2016 to a 20, just for instance, that's four years, but um, it's probably stuff that you can't buy for your 16 to make it into the 20. Yeah, it's like they're, a new, new body the, style, actually. The, yeah, there's something that's, that's, that's changed that's going to be hard to accomplish using aftermarket. Mm -hmm. But it's not so much that that bike is abs obsolete. And, you know, and, and that and when it becomes obsolete really kind of depends on your, you know, your ability level and how much you can really take advantage of the bike or if you're using the bike for the right purpose and uh, a lot of things like that. So I don't think your bike's outdated. And it, if you really like it, I wouldn't have a problem spending two to three grand on it because it's good for another five or six years. That yeah. bike, I mean, I'm riding a 2012 KTM 500 quite a bit. Uh, more than anything else I'm riding right now. And I have a, what year's yours, Bob? Uh, 2017. So 17. Yeah, so 17. I haven't even ridden it. And and I have it. It's sitting there. I could ride it, but I haven't ridden it because I don't need to because it, it's not that much of an improvement for for what I'm doing. And then I've ridden the 20 and the same thing. That's the next evolution. And between the 12 and the 20, Yes, you, 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 yeah. there's there's a weight feel difference and there's engine character difference and is it better? I think if you're if you're if you're kind of going with you want to, it's just it's different. And if you've gotten used to what you're on, the different may not be better. But as you ride it more, you start to appreciate what that different is. Mm -hmm. And I, I find this all the time is that as long as I don't ride that new one too much. I don't mind my old one that much, but if I ride that new one a lot, I go back to my old one and I notice yeah, you like, don't know what you miss. Yeah. Them. Like, Hey, this throttle response has gotten a little better. This, this lighter motor that doesn't feel as powerful is actually just has a better power delivery or more torque. You know what you really use torque. It may not make as much horsepower for some strange reason, but like, when am I riding that bike needing peak horsepower? It's like the rideability became better on, yeah. on stuff. And that's what they, it, it's funny because before with motocross bikes, even competition bikes, they were just power, power, power. You know, they're talking about how much power made. Yeah. And now they're really focusing. I think Honda, like their whole thing on their their new 450 is just better control. They want to give you better control. Drivability is what, mm -hmm. what it comes down to. They actually they actually are saying that out loud before because when you said that out loud, I mean, it makes less power. And that bike has been the bike that's been making kind of the most power in the 450 class mm -hmm. and now they're they're going along with like drivability so yeah that's tough though. it's not as sexy of a headline though i mean you want to say like most powerful bike that's e that's an easy headline to write but yeah i i think yeah. it, and, and maybe maybe they're kind of convinced that they already have it mm -hmm. they may they might think that they have it so it's like okay now we're gonna have it and market on top of that but it doesn't matter what they say in marketing it's how it actually kind of turns out and works on the mm -hmm. track and i've i know guys that have ridden that bike and they say that yeah, on the track, it's uh, it it's noticeable. It's good. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I won't know until I ride it. But 
good people have told me good things. Okay, cool. Uh, that's the that basic part of the question. He said his bike has 500 hours on it. And, and would you recommend okay, uh, so, 350, 300, YZ, 250? Oh, he's, uh, he's, so he's, if he gets a new bike. He's already shopping, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's been in the dealership a few times, so, I think. So this is this how one question could take over the entire show. Yeah, yeah. I'm, hey, we're not, we haven't even gotten into chassis geometry and swing arm angles yet, which we're over that at this point. Um so, so here's, you know, here's the thing. It's like, it's like, do you want to start over? Cause it more than likely, like some of these modifications that you, that you want to do to your current bike, you would probably want to do to a new mm. stock one also. So let's just say recluse, you know, they don't come with recluse yet. So your recluse, that's still, you're going to spend, you know, $800 on your new recluse. And so if you have, you know, the price of a new bike, I don't think 500 hours is all that much on a on a KTM 350. I mean, when you start getting up there around a thousand, then you're into the, for most people, the mystery zone. And I'm up, I'm getting up there on my bikes and I'm still not looking to sell them because they have a thousand hours on them. Um, so that's not the, that's not the problem. But, um, if, you know, what, what is it? Let me see his question exactly on the, on the, on the thing there. Um, let's see. If if I went new, would you recommend a 350, a 300, a YZ 250FX, or something else? So you just went down like three different categories of bikes. Um, I've never owned a two-stroke except my uh, son's 200 XCW, which is a blast. Uh, yeah, it's I have one, and somebody offered me some money for it, and I'm thinking, do I take that money and go get a 300 because that's what I really want? Uh I rode a friend's 2018 300 six days and thought it felt amazingly light, and I had more fun, and I was more confident, like it helped me ride better, though I know it really isn't the whole story. Uh, I need to put a better rider on the bike. Well, hey, you read my logo on my T-shirt. I wonder how you could, <laughs> how, how would you accomplish that, becoming a better rider? Yeah, uh, just JimmyLewisOffRoadTraining.com. <laughs> No, Jimmy Lewis, Jimmy Lewis off road dot com. Yeah, whatever. Off road with Jimmy dot com. Yeah, off road with Jimmy dot com. Uh, ask George; he'll put the link up in the yeah in the site. Now you're um, cyber squatters taking up all your uh, web oh, domains. Oh, they've tried it before. <laughs> so, when you start talking about going to another bike, uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm in. The, I'm asking myself the same question. I'm sitting here. Waiting for the the right excuse to buy. I'm actually waiting for George to buy an, mm. a new a new KTM two stroke, and then I'll just buy his old one. Or mm, maybe what I'll good. what I'll have him do is I'll have him buy a brand new 300, and then I'll he'll have me ride it, and then I'll go, man, I like your old one better, and then proceed to buy the new one out from under him because mm-hmm. he's not. Good, he's, I hope he's not listening. That's a good move. Yeah. <laughs> So I just learned something right there. Yeah. No, about me. No, just the, just the, uh, the uh, switcheroo on bike purchasing. I think hey, it's great. Bikes are all good. I, actually, I went, <laughs> you know, I, I've, I've heard through the rumor mill that I've driven up the price of uh, the Husaberg 570s on the on the market. Oh, really? Just yeah. spe- speculative buyers. Yeah, speculative <laughs> buyers and people people that, that own them and they they've they've had to work on them and then they they, they develop the love hate relationship that I have with them. Mm-hmm. Have I ever told you about my Husaberg 570? I've heard uh, I've heard stories. About Do you know it. what it has? No, I, a lot of power. A lot of power. I mean, like a lot. Just tire shredding well, power. It's Re- remember, remember. Uh, we don't care about that right now. It's just how much power just has. Peak. Remember, <laughs> remember, remember. Yesterday, when you were driving your truck and it, you were driving it and it had a lot of power, and then it had not yeah, a lot. None. Yeah, yeah, I remember that yesterday. Right. So that's what it feels like when I got on every other motorcycle after I rode my Husaberg. They just don't have uh, that much power. I had to. I had to do that because the last. <laughs> The last, the last show. You should ask me about this cut on my face. Uh, the, the last show, I forgot to mention my Husaberg. Yeah. So. Jimmy, I could be like your Ed McMahon, hang yeah. out, laugh at your joke. Hey, uh, tell us what happened to your face. You're gonna have not. You're gonna have to have not lo- uh, knock Logan off. Uh, yeah, we can coexist, dude. Yeah, coexist. Yeah, Chai takes up got the a, empty space, the, the six feet dif- yeah. distance. Yeah, uh, it's a secret. I really can't talk about it. It was all bruised, though. You saw it like on the other day. Yeah, it's bad. Put helmet on now, it's ugly. Um, I was wearing uh, an Alpine Stars helmet, their new helmet, and I was riding up a hill, at Glen Helen, and I had a YZ450 wide open. I mean, I was pinned, and uh, basically, it was really slippery because they just they'd been watering. It was just watering, and it was late in the afternoon, and there was those cut bumps, and I don't know exactly what happened, hence. 
<laughs> I my head hit the ground so stinking hard. It was just it was it was pinned to face plant and I didn't I didn't lose consciousness, but I did kind of see stars and I was on a on the uphill looking down at the bike. So I went over the handlebars and, and like I said the my hands did not come off the handlebars when I hit the ground. Cause it was, I think it was sliding, and I think the front end was was light, unweighted. I think I set it down in like a rut, kind of like in a, and it kind of cross rutted, mm-hmm. and at the same time the bike grabbed traction and it just like spun it around or through. I don't know. I I wish I could visualize that one half a second where I went from everything was great to face on the ground, mm-hmm. but I hit hard enough to where yeah I was dingy, and I'm standing there looking at the. The, the slide marks, you know, I, that you could tell I was looking at where the bike landed and I, I could see my line where I'd gone through the mud and stuff. And I was just trying to figure out how the heck. The slide marks from your body. No, no, the body, the, the, the body didn't slide. The body stuck. My head stuck. That's it, even worse. So the helmet doesn't have a whole lot of um, uh, scratches on it, mm-hmm. but it absolutely did its job. I mean, it, I mean, the whole, like I said, the whole side of my face is bruised. This is from my goggle. Mm-hmm. My goggle, uh, the inside where it holds the foam, kind of went in and kind of pressed yeah, and cut. Sure. I had a bruise on the upper part of the other side of my nose. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have I have uh, kind of scabbies around oh, yeah. Still there. my eyelids because mm-hmm. it smashed hard enough where that whole helmet, and the helmet had MIPS in it, which is that that technology that allows the 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 helmet um, to slide around the foam. So it's like, oh, okay. it separates the liner from the from the phone and is bolted in, so it slips. So I think what happened is it, it impacted and then it slid and most of the, so there's the bruising, which mm-hmm. is a lot of it. And then the most of the, the, the other marks are burns. And, I mean, literally it's like from? from the friction. Mm-hmm. I think, like I was saying, so I, I had, I don't know, so, uh, what's his name, Lad? Uh, 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 he should figure it out yeah, for you. Fa- the, the, the forces of, of 200 pound Jimmy at 22 miles an hour yeah. uh, at the 45 degree angle of the Glen Helen Hill. gigawatts to your face. Whatever. Oh, yeah, so, yeah, yeah, F uh, equals MA. So but, is that helmet junk now? I haven't pulled it apart to look at it yet. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, like I said, I, I externally looked at the outside, and I kn- I put it. I had washed the liner before, so I just put the liner back in, and mm-hmm. I remembered how I'm like, oh, this MIPS, blah blah blah, you know. Yeah. And I remember how slippery that that particular helmet's MIPS was. Uh, but I'm going to go in and look very closely at the foam. I mean, I had to, I got back here, and then we hopped in trucks and went driving all over the desert for the last few days. Yeah. Uh, well, we tried to. Well, we drove over ninety percent so, of the desert. Well, two of us have trucks that were physically dead at the end of the <laughs> the, the driving. Um, and now at least one of them still runs. Two out of two. Yeah, two out of two. Death, uh, death ratio. Why, well, everybody asks me, why do you have so many trucks? Because like, I use them. <laughs> that way when one's dead, we tow it back here and hop in another one and take off. Uh, so I haven't had a chance to analyze the helmet, but I, I'm fully convinced that the helmet did, absolutely did its job. I hate to test helmets like that, but now I've test, tested it to... Uh, uh, were you wearing a neck support? No, don't wear those. Like no, I've never. Uh, I've tried them, and I've n- haven't not been a fan. And but the way that I hit, it wouldn't have been, and it wasn't a neck. Like I said, it kind of came. Just, it just, it, it kind of came in the side. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so all things considered, I you know I pick myself up, and I'm like, okay, I got to stop riding because I'm like, I I got a little concussed. Um, rode back to the truck, and I remember. Well, I remember I was felt fine from riding all the way there back to the truck. When I sat down to the truck. I couldn't remember where on the track I crashed. And I was there and I felt like I was all there, but I'm like, I'm not here. I'm not, this isn't good. Um, so yeah, I, I had some people keep an eye on me and, and didn't go to sleep till a little bit, you know, till a lot later on that evening and every, till made sure everything was okay. So um, I did the concussion protocol. What, what, what are we talking how, about again? Yeah. yeah. How many, how many high lives is the concussion protocol? No, it's zero. Oh, yeah, massive. yeah. Stay, stay. Yeah, stay. I didn't. I didn't have one until like the last hour of driving. Uh, I mean, Heather was driving, but the last because we drove back out here afterwards. I mean, yeah. I drove back to Cal, back to California, and I came back out here because we had to leave. So I, I might have had a highlight, middle high life at the end of the evening. Okay, maybe you should just like <laughs> maybe chill out a little bit too. I did. I haven't ridden a motorcycle since then. I just blew truck up. Yeah, <laughs> it's probably I wasn't myself. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what else you got in the chat room there? Uh, we have questions. You, you, we have a question. Um, oh, hey, interesting news. Uh, Suzuki because it uh, introduces a um, 
they have a tuner. They call it New MX Tuner 2.0, which is looks very much like a, a GET system that now they have a plug into their ECU. So uh, it, what really sucks is I love I like that stuff. I like playing with. It. I think it's awesome. We just gave back our RMZ 250, and I could have played with it on that. So because they oh. haven't changed it for a while. So oh, it was tuner compatible. Tuner, you yeah, tuner. you could plug it. You could buy. It. It's about a five hundred dollar kit, you know, that you can get. But like, it's like buying fifteen pipes and and. 20 carburetors. We don't have carburetors, but, you know, a couple different ignitions. It's The tuners are the best like, thing. Like you that can. many combinations of setups. Yeah, you got a million combinations. Mm-hmm. You can you can make the bike work how it, how it wants to. And the interesting thing is you can program a different map to each one of their clips. They have clips that go on the, you know, they have a traction, they have a traction one or leaner or richer, I think mm-hmm. they call their clips. But you can program different maps into the clips. So you can just, you can program a couple things and just clip a new one on. Oh, clip that's a like a little one. dongle you can actually plug in without having to right. full. Oh, that's I, cool. I wish they were like Yamaha, which has a button that you just push one button and you have two different maps ready to go. But mm-hmm. whatever works. Uh, so Brian Walker has a question. Um, let's get down with Brian Walker. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, I'll just jump right to your question on... Uh, moose, uh, bib moose is uh, pretty interesting. Uh, bib moose. Oh, no, no, Brian Walker right there. Wouldn't you be? That's that's a question. That's a question. That's a question. Dude, you're better at deciphering what's a question than I am. You have to read everything. That's what Logan okay. does. Logan okay. doesn't, Logan doesn't he just think doesn't, he just, he just operates. No, he, see, I'm like, I'm trying to do like editorial thing right now and it's not working. Out, right. So, so Logan sees me grab this uh-huh. and he just starts reading a question. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, I'll grab a bottle opener for you. Yeah, that's good because you you kind of cut me off there with this twist off thing. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry, sorry. I thought we were gonna like assistance in the whole thing up here, like just handing us like. That's good. It's it's a show that keeps on giving. Very very. right. Here we go. Uh, Brian Walker uh, riding a CRF two hundred and fifty L. His question: Wouldn't you be wide open in the sixth gear on the freeway? Seems to me that would be a super valuable adjustment that you would use frequently. Humbly asking, am I wrong? So I think what Brian is trying to say is like it, at freeway speed, you're going to be wide open on a CRF 250L in six gear. Yes, probably. Uh, and you're probably going to be getting passed because most people go 80 and 90 on the freeway and that CRF likes to go about 70. So is it a problem? No. That bike is designed to run. I guarantee that thing will run you could you could hop on the freeway right now, hold it wide open for a hundred hours if you keep gas going into it, and it would be fine. Mm-hmm. Um, so no, it's not a it's not an issue, and it's not anything to worry about. And yes, you would be wide open, and on small displacement bikes like that, uh, the the what we'll call the not the high performance two fifty four strokes, but the ones that are built into dual sport platforms and play bike platforms, you can hold those things wide open all day long if you if you left them mostly stock and you're not gonna have any issues at all. So Brian, pin it. Don't trip. Yeah, uh, pin it. Change gearing? No, because it won't pull like I think we I, I don't recall it so I mean, here here's where I have to, I can't remember because too many bikes. I don't know if that has a five or six speed in there. I think it has a five speed. His question says six six gear. Wouldn't so. it be nice to have a six gear? Wouldn't you be in six gear? So maybe it does have a six gear. Wouldn't you be wide gear. open and in six gear? Yeah. So well, whatever top gear is, um, if it's a five speed, for sure fifth is giving you top speed. But on some of the bikes that have the six speed gear, sometimes six six gear is not where you're going to get top speed. You'll actually get mm-hmm. top speed in fifth. Six gear allows you to shift into somewhat of an overdrive, yeah, yeah. or it allows for going faster on downhills. Mm-hmm. Because if you're fifth gear, if you're topped out in oh, fifth okay. gear and flat, mm-hmm. if you go down a downhill, you start hitting the rev limiter in fifth gear going down yeah, the hill. So yeah. sixth gear. That's the way I used to gear my 125s that were faster than everybody else's. I heard you were in seventh gear when you uh, seventh. had your face action. Yeah. No. <laughs> seventh gear. He's got I can't, I can't custom remember. trainers, can't remember. people. It's, it's fully custom. Can't remember. Uh, Brian Walker, next question. Uh, bib Moose Lube for tubes, Jimmy. Think about it. Uh, I came across this online. The back of a Michelin gel lubricant tube reads, using half a tube of gel per tire with an inner tube will reduce risk of puncture due to shocks or nipping in the off-road or enduro competitions. Uh, Keeping the tubes from tire wear and overheating plus reducing potential pinch flats seems like a good idea. Have you tried this? Question. What do you think? Question. Is it too messy for a field repair? Question. Or is it just a waste of time? Um, so he's asking about putting bib mousse lube inside of a tube to lubricate the tube between the tire. 
Exactly. I have I have tried this because because when I was racing with tubes, we tried a lot of different stuff. It wasn't specifically bib mousse lube at the time. We used we tried Vaseline, and we also tried Murphy soap uh, just to see if it made any sort of a difference. Mm-hmm. Uh, What'd you find? We compared it to nothing, and we compared it to baby powder. And we found that it made not a lot of difference. <laughs> nothing that we could, like, actually test. Uh, but it, it, but I've always found that baby powder in the, in the tire with the tube is probably the best thing because it doesn't seem to, it seems like even if you get it wet, it sort of dries itself back out and it, it keeps some sort of a, a friction modifier, you would say between the tube and the tire of some sort. Lick and, and we're, you know, we're riding in dry most of the time. I don't know if I was riding in wet all the time if that that a good mousse lube that that's more of a petroleum type mm-hmm. jelly not the Murphy soap because the Murphy soap this is any anything I found that's a that's a that's a lube that's a soap tends to wash out it yeah it like a water will carry it away where the oil seems like it wants to stay a little bit yeah, more Yeah you need something oil based So I've always been a fan of just baby powder you know a fair amount of baby powder in there kind of keeps the keeps the Keeps the tube, which is your baby's butt, uh, <laughs> happy inside. And that's probably a little bit easier to like if you if you are changing a flat a little cleaner yeah. than like having. And if you do place. have to, if you do have to patch it, you can wipe it off and clean like, it. Glue to it. Okay. So uh, for sure, if you have like something that's really slippery in there, it's going to be difficult to clean it off uh, to to mm-hmm. get it to stick a patch on there. Although we most of us carry a spare tube, sort of a deal. Yeah. Um, I, I think you're you know splitting hairs at that point. It may work better in some sit situations and stuff, but I mean at the at the cost of the lube versus baby powder, I would go with the baby powder. And unless I'm riding in wet environments, and then uh, I mean where you just expect your inside of your tire to be wet all the time, maybe something like that might work. But um, isn't water kind of a lubricant too? Essentially, uh, yeah. If it's wet inside there, kind of not as not as good as not as good as something oily. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, good. Uh, run the test for me. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just just run a moose, and then you don't have to worry about that tube thing. That's probably the actual solution. I yeah, just put, put a moose in there. So, yeah. um, Brian Walker, run a moose. Run a moose. Yeah. There we go. Say run a moose. We've yeah. spoken. Is that it? Is that our question? Uh, that's all. I... That's that's yeah. That was the end. Of that is that the whole question. What's this one? Oh God, dude! I think, you know, I just probably should just like more I, just like just I, read what's on the page and not even try and think. I think you need just we need to put one, two, three, four. That's just, what I had this pen for early on. Right, I was scribbling all the. Well, most of the time you're going like this with the pen. Yeah, that that kind of I didn't <laughs> I didn't really catch on to that for a while. That's okay. It's my first podcast. <laughs> uh, uh, Brian Walker, let's get down with question number three. Uh, lastly, my son and I did some remodeling of our garage. Always good to do. Uh, the remodel includes a 2020 FE501 and a 2021 Tenere 700. Thanks for your in-depth reviews. Good job, Jimmy Lewis. Uh, make sure those manufacturers have your address and get that mailbox money rolling in. Yo, should be yours. Uh, regardless, I plan to meet in the fall for some riding lessons. Thanks, Brownie. Good. He's Covered all the bases. The only, the only thing he didn't do is buy a T-shirt. Well, Brian, and you bought a T-shirt. I did. I remember I sent you some T-shirts. I got crap all over it in the like, second day later, <laughs> so I need to buy a few more. Hey, we're gonna run back into the chat room and grab some of these uh, questions. So Eduardo Rojas says, "Next Tuesday, show yours bikes." He says, "Yours, yours bikes for more interactive live show." Cheers. So uh, Eric, you gonna be around next Tuesday? Well, so what we'll do is we'll move this whole table forward, and then you just ride one bike in right through the back of the set and out that door, and just go get it. We'll just like start cycling them through here, like right into the shop. Actually, we could move this whole podcast into the shop, and then we'd lose all these wires, and then we have a horrible podcast. So we'll see about that. Um, Chris Real says from sea level to five thousand feet. Boom! He would know. Not too much engine power change. Above five that above five thousand feet, it starts making a difference due to oxygen content in the air. So there we go, Mister uh, 85 miles an hour, and I got ninety six. Uh, I've had better air. Now we were both at the same air level. Okay, uh, Mike Spurgeon, that's Taco Mike. What's the typical horsepower loss of an O ring chain versus an MX chain? 
Uh, Mike, you have to ask me that and uh, tell me what temperature outside it is outside because it, it's a factor of the temperature. <laughs> uh, the te- okay, the temperature seventy. Uh, some Brenton says, "Dude, awesome." Who's dude, and who's awesome? <laughs> Not you, I. Um, Let's see. Jeff Betnick says, I'm 6'5", 285 and bald, and we're not all short. Oh, my poor bikes. <laughs> bald, he could come to your podcast. Uh, and uh, Mark Daniels is having a barbie, barbecue mesquite tri-tip pepper jack sourdough burgers in Pacifico. Like right now. Yeah. <laughs> we had tri-tip the other night. Yeah, Actually, we, we I have some slices of that stuff left. We're, oh, that's really? what we're having for dinner. Why don't we skip lunch? Uh, Dennis is checking in from uh, Alaska. Let's see. And now they're talking about tri-tip in the uh, chat room. Let's see. Mike says, recluse reps have told me an XC clutch will help a bike run cooler and extend oil service life. To what level do you think those two things are true on, say, an XC350F? So, um, so he's talking about the full recluse uh, auto clutch, and why do you call it an XC? It's called a what's the recluse? It's called a. I'm drawing a uh, drawing a blank here. What's it's called a what's the full what's the full clutch called? There's the, um, I think he's missing a letter. The one that works like a clutch. Yeah, it's, it's it does automatically. Yeah, it's called the it's a, I should know this exp. He, he meant to say EXP, there I think. Right That's right. why it just confused me. So EXP. So the EXP does all the clutching for you. And if the... And, and somebody called... Actually, my doctor, my medical doctor, called me and was saying, hey, I have a recluse on my bike and my bike overheats more than my buddies. And I'm like, well, are you pulling the clutch lever? And he's like, yeah. And I go, you're overheating it, not the recluse. I can help him with some setup that'll make it less prevalent because I like them to engage the lower RPM so they slip less. But so if you're using the recluse properly, it absolutely will extend oil life and lower the temperature of the bike because you're not going to be slipping as much as most riders would. Hmm. In other words, and if you're slipping your clutch less than a recluse, you're probably stalling a lot. You're the kind of guy that stalls a lot Mm -hmm. because you're really not slipping it at all. And you need to slip a clutch in order not to stall. So if you're using it properly, you're letting it do its thing, you're fine. Here are the exceptions. Recluses work so good that I know that guys that ride one and sometimes two gears tall, Bob, yeah, four (laughs) gears tall. Yeah, Bob got a recluse and he found out he could ride in fourth gear all the time. And then it, it, it mellowed his power delivery out to the level that he was accustomed to. And then he wondered why his recluse was, his bike was getting hot and his recluse was... Getting you did you, you stopped before it became too late. It What'd you do? Was, no, it was the stupid operator. I mean, it was nothing did you smoke it? Uh, oh yeah. Oh yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. First time ever. The very first recluse I ever rode. It was actually I rode a Revlock, and and I also rode a recluse. I did this. I did it on purpose because I realized how well that stuff, how well they worked, and I wanted to know what it would take to fry the clutch. So I was down at Takati on an XR four hundred. This tells you the time frame we're talking in the in the 96 97 and i was riding the bike in third gear around first gear turns and stuff like that and it worked amazing until all of a sudden until it is like you you felt it wasn't biting anymore so in xr 400s weren't necessarily known for having the best clutches because they would heat up and the oil would heat up and here we go back to our original question about like the clutches i'm like whoa this is it's it's working. I'm able to ride this bike fast and not do anything. Just leave it in third gear and just screw the throttle on. Mm-hmm. But now it's not biting like it used to when I finally get it like up to the RPM where, you know, it's locked and engaged. Now it's like not locked and not totally engaged and it's slipping all just the time. More more. It's like it's like I'm pulling my lever in just a little bit all the time, mm-hmm. which is what happens. So if you do that, yeah, you will make it run hotter. If you use it properly, it's not an issue. My 500 with their collusive fourth gear reminded me of the old Husky Automatic, and I'm driving along going, well, I wonder how long this will last. And not very. Right. <laughs> yeah, It uh, no, it, it, it uh, it's not a Husky Automatic, but it probably lasts longer than those. Um, 
Let's see. Uh, Dan Welsh, a lot of time on rear sag. What about the front? <laughs> So the front's a little bit hard to adjust the sag on. Some bikes have adjustable. Actually, some of the KTM, the Huskies and the KTM Six Days bikes have the preload adjusters. Adjust your rear sag first, and then if you want to make fine tune adjustments, use the front. Use the if you have adjustable on the front. So there's a measurement for it, so you that you can tell. But most people, when they when they sit on their bike and when they check their sag and stuff, it's really not affecting the front as much because you're not really where you're going to be when you're riding because as you start riding and you start moving you 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 know you start getting forward uh on the bike and it might have a little bit more of an effect there it's just like it's air pressure when you have an air fork and different things but um the front is what i would call the rear is tuning the front is fine tuning and until you until you're I, I don't know if I would actually start playing with the front until I was pretty happy with what my rear suspension was doing overall. And then I would start thinking about what I want to do with the handling and I would adjust it all in the back. And then when I felt like the back was working good and I don't want to mess with the way my rear shock is working, but I, I need a little more bite in the front. I might lessen the preload on the, on the fork get it. or Stupid add some. Rig. And Hey, if you have a uh, four CS forks back to another question, we were talking about the four CS forks. Use the air pressure inside of that fork to help the, quote, problem everybody's talking about. Run your 4CS fork with a little bit of negative pressure. That's what I almost always did was I ran my 4CS fork. I would I would put like a, a air bleeder valve on it, and I would take the fork, and I would sit on the bike, and I would push it down about, uh, you know, an inch or two in the stroke and shh, bleed it off and then let it up and lift it up. So it was running negative air pressure oh. in the forks. And that was one of the tricks to get that fork to work the way I wanted it to. Uh, just uh, to, I remember he said for a CS fork, and I kind of gl- glanced over so that. So did but, that just pull the pull the fork down, which would st- stiff would speed up the steering? But it's I, also like that's that's it, the spring pressures at the same time, right? So how does you're, that work? you're modifying some something in there, I, and it just seemed like it just having that little bit of negative pressure allowed it to move the initial stroke to get it moving because that's mm-hmm. where they were, they were known because. They had an, it was basically, I think the 4CS had an extra seal in there. There was an extra chamber and there was an extra seal and that extra seal was causing a little bit of extra stiction. And so by just giving it the ability to move, once it's moving, it's fine. You know, you, that's part of the damning, but just to get it moving seemed to be where, where okay. that fork it's suffered. Like so hit. having that little bit of negative pressure always to me um, seemed to help. And, it, and then also realize on those forks and most white uh, WP forks in general, the compression and rebound adjusters act more on mid-speed damping than they do on low speed. So it's a little bit different of an adjustment than a than a Kaaba and a and a Showa, which we're familiar with. It's that those seem to be true low speed adjustments where the the WP tend to be have a little bit more effect on like mid-speed uh hmm, valving. Can a weekend warrior really tell the difference between a 2014 and a 2020 KTM? Uh, yes, I think so. I think so. I mean, yeah. I, I have the last three KTM. Because one has a carburetor like- and one has fuel injection. Well, or are we we're talking about four strokes? Uh, if it's four strokes, one feels 10 pounds lighter and like it has less power. Yeah, well, I think it's back because I said a model year. It's just like, you know, it's I, the last few bikes I've had have been like one model the year, the next, the next. And they're all just like, just everything's just five or 10% better, like across the board. Uh, Troy Hicks says, Yamahas are evil. They want to kill you. <laughs> Troy, this program is sponsored by KTM. Uh, KTM, hold on, should we call Logan? <laughs> uh, th- thanks for saying that, but uh, I did. Yamaha did not want to kill me. It was it was a hundred percent rider error because if I hadn't have been on the motorcycle, I wouldn't have crashed. So let's just start there, mm-hmm. and then there's work up to the point where I actually thought my I ran out of what do they call it talent gears. Yeah. No, I I was in the right gear. I, everything <laughs> I was doing everything perfect, but my talent level wasn't able to recover yeah. from whatever. Mm-hmm. It's whatever good. happened um himself when it all happened. Mm-hmm. yeah high five himself. how do you know how did you know that <laughs> congratulating myself while i was while i was crashing i was That's just the usual scenario. well actually i ride I, here okay here's back to my very idealized way of riding which in an ideal world works perfect but in the real world could cause some problems if you let it go overboard 
I ride so light on the handlebars now. I mean, I, I, because of my wrists mostly, but I bet you I was so light on the handlebars and, and so relaxed that whenever they set down, they got yanked out of my hands Mm -hmm. because that's what happens with my wrists is that is my, is when I, when, when I, when the, when the nerves get crushed, my hands open up and I, they may have snapped and something might've laid down. Are you going to do something with Travis? I'm just going to, I'm just going to. If you play with him, he makes noise. Hang out and talk. If you squeeze, if you squeeze his, squeeze his suspension. Oh, you're going to demonstrate what how I crashed. Yeah. Here, full forensic. See, Logan did that the other day in the show, and I got him in trouble. <laughs> I know. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, let's see. If you just Troy Hicks again, uh, if you just rode a moped, this wouldn't not happen. Oh, you haven't seen me ride a moped. <laughs> um. Uh, Brenton Anderson. That's Bre- that's uh, Brent Anderson. Thanks for answering yeah, my good. question, Jimmy. You nailed my riding position. Uh, we'll see you in class, maybe in Washington. Hey, Brent, um, Ben, Ben, Benton, Benton, and Ben. Yeah. I'll, I'll butcher your name. Like who? Who's the guy that from last week? La- we got to get his name. <laughs> the guy from last week that helped us with his drawings. Um, Watch our newsletter, and we're going to announce what we've got coming in Washington, hopefully by the 1st of September. It's so close. Uh, and Victor, uh, Victor's not banned on Facebook anymore. He says, uh, hmm. that microphone makes those beer caps sound so good. Let me grab one. What's that? <laughs> really, usually we're getting chastised for our uh, sound quality here. Um, San Felipe, Bob, says it kind of looks like a tiny dog on the show. There was a tiny dog yeah, on this was. show. Yeah, the Chihuahua. Um, Mark Daniels here. We're going to drop some knowledge. He'll never, never tried this, but heard of guys in Australia use grease in their tires with tubes, and they say baby powder is for your butt. <laughs> oh, Mark. Yeah, so the Pacificos are kicking in. Mm-hmm. Um, Christian Parker, he's leaving the shop, which is Rottweiler Performance. The reason he said that is he wants me to mention Rottweiler Performance. And I'm going to go after Christian Parker for some advertising dollars so I can get his logo up on these screens, I think. You should. Yeah, because we talk about him enough. Yeah, he's, he's, uh, uh, this is his target market for sure. He needs to get out here I'll give him a plug right soon. now if you want. Really? Yeah. I've okay. Got his, I've got his uh, trio on my 990, man. It's, it, it's baffling that there was that much improvement to make for aftermarket, like the, the, the factory system of the... Uh, glove box and this not suck that bad. Like his improvements is night and day better. It's really good. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna step in and you know only because yeah. KTM is a sponsor. Yeah. So I'm gonna step in here and say that they have a lot more to think about as far as you know they have some space constraints because of a lot of the emissions components and mm-hmm. stuff like that and and they can't you know there's noise requirements that they're trying to yeah, to no, I, do yeah, I get that. and crazy 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 stuff that that. You know, that's what, well, so on that, we were working on your, um, your, uh, Ford today and you notice that even though your radiator was broken, but that's a whole different story. Mm-hmm. Uh, the aftermarket thing that you had mounted on the front, the intercooler yeah, was broke, mount was broken. Yeah. So we're talking about trucks here. Now he has a, a Ford, uh, what is it? Uh, Expedition. It's Expedition. Really nice, really nice truck. Uh, set up really well. It does great until the water level exceeds the height of the fan blades in the radiator. Yeah. And, and I think this is just me guessing what happened is we drove across a really, really deep water crossing, mm-hmm. and I, I told him to go first because I had a winch and I could pull him back out if he didn't make it. <laughs> and I went for it. And he went for it. He, he was <laughs> driving through, and I, he was going at a pretty good clip. And and I and it was it was literally making a, a wave in the water, not like not like not, you didn't send it. You drove in there nice and safe and mm-hmm. smooth, but then it looked like it started like kind of floating a little bit and losing traction and, and hopping up and down on the yeah. on the bumps underneath. And I think what happened is that wave started pushing and the water actually there was a splash that came back up and it got the plastic radiator fans, oh, yeah. the blades. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the water came back up and the fans, uh, well, the, the motors kept s- spinning, but the fan blades didn't. Right. It's and, hydraulically locks it, the fan break, blades break off. And guess where they went? Oh, was it your radiator or his? It was his my, radiator. My radiator. Yeah, no worries. Yeah, no worries. Yeah, like, no worries. like five holes in it. Yeah, well, we, we patched <laughs> one really good. 
It was just like I did the other week with uh, Johnny Campbell's um, CR450X that I laid over in a turn and I had to patch the radiator. I managed to patch that, but mm -hmm. I tried to patch Mike's radiator and it didn't work. Need more patch. So we towed him back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> with with my one Dodge truck that's still running, or one of five or one of four. That was kind of carnage this weekend, huh? Yeah, carnage. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, that's what we've been doing. We've been out working on Rebel Rally. Um, thanks, Rebel Rally, for the four delays of tequila. Thanks, uh, Emily and Larry. They take care of us with that. Um, since I don't want to talk in a few seconds, why don't you help me with that thing? And okay. remember, it's not it's a, sipping tequila. Okay, I'll put you a baby again. Sorry. Um, actually, Emmy's on. Oh, geez. Emily's on the, uh, the thing. Right here, huh? <laughs> that these work? That, yeah, you, it's not twist off, bro. It's a cork. <laughs> um, what about the Roddy 1190 intakes? Uh, Troy, glad you asked. Um, so he's asking about the Rottweiler um, 1190 intakes or 1090 or any of his intake systems. They're really, really good. They, they will give you a more power, in my experience, especially in the old carbureted bikes, way better fuel economy. And you can tune the... Um, power delivery based on the 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 velocity stacks, uh, and I think I can answer those questions. I, I like the really short ones because they don't make as much power on the dyno, but they definitely make the bike more rideable and drivable. And Chris will sell you the like the taller ones because they make more power on the dyno. That's what everybody really wants. But if you talk to Chris, he'll set you right. And he or talk to any of his guys. He's got sharp guys working down there that'll that'll tell you how stuff really works. Um. Uh, <laughs> uh, George is going to tell you. It says, "I just, I just glanced at it." it says the manual for the Raptor says. <laughs> so, so hey, hey, he's he's showing off, and I showed you took a picture yeah. of my truck going through that water. Yeah, you know how slow I went through there, right? Oh yeah. Um, I didn't know what I was doing, but I knew I had a winch, and I saw all those poles along the side, so I knew that I could hook up to your truck or one of those poles yeah, and pull me out. There. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I could put Warren I, Winch, I, by the way. I, 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 I have put a, my arm out the window and I could touch the water. Yeah. Like, oh, it was, yeah, it was halfway up the door. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, yeah, my, I, I trust my Warren Winch has rolled over a few Suzuki Samurais recently, um, help, help them unroll. It says you can go through 36 inches of water, but you should be careful of water seeping into the cab. I did that in my truck. I got water in the cab. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it got in, it, it, all my carpet was all wet. Um, but, uh, too bad I missed it. I could have told you both home. <laughs> well, thanks, George. That's cool. Yeah, That's glad, good to know. I'll yeah, call good. you next time. I, yeah, I thought you were going to come with us, but something kept you. Um, yeah, we drank most of the uh, the Ford Laser. It's up in the it's up at the secret spot. So all good. Hey, I think with that we've uh, concluded the majority of our questions. We've answered every qu uh, every question asked of us without referring to a reference manual, which is not the best way to do it, but we're relying on years of experience uh, to come up with this stuff. Yeah, you're a human reference manual. Um, okay. Uh, we're going to work on this here real quick. Wow, I got a lot of messages. I must have done something wrong on the phone. No, you got fans out there, homie. Yeah, so... We're going to make sure we can do our last uh, ad read uh, as reflected in our contracts. Hey, if you're interested in uh, sponsoring Tech Talk Taco Tuesday, feel free to uh, contact Jimmy at dirtbiketest.com. Unlike the people that have been contacting me lately that have been going, uh, what's your CPM advertising rates uh, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> all this other stuff that doesn't really make sense to me? Um, hey, Logan. Hello. What's uh what's on your list? What? What's on your list? What's where? Yeah, you know, you you're just supposed to go straight into the Got read, man. Powered by a I don't know. I what are you you watching cartoons there or uh doing jumping no. jacks? Or fishing. Fishing. Yeah. Isn't it dark? No. No. It doesn't come down until like nine. Oh, you must be north of here. Yeah. He's in the Arctic. Yeah. Good. Okay, so uh if you weren't fishing, you'd be riding a KTM. And what is KTM? Um, they are powered by a distinct ready-to-race mentality. KTM is the world's leading high-performance street and off-road sport motorcycle fan manufacturer with North American headquarters based in Marietta, California. Over the years, KTM has built a reputation as a fierce competitor on racetracks around the world. And the brand's remarkable global global success is reflected in every product it develops, and every 
move it makes. Awesome. Boom. What, it. what do you got? Logging. What do you got on the end of the line right now? Trout, grouper, salmon, oh. halibut, <laughs> trout, pike, trout. You're fishing for trout. Yeah. Good. How's the mosquitoes? Not too bad today. <laughs> awesome. Well, hey Logan, just for doing that uh, on call, perfect tonight. You get to come back next week. You nailed it, Logan. <laughs> Yeah, Mike. Mike says he's not yeah. coming. Not coming back. Yeah, there's like a guy. Actually, you should have listened to how many problems he had reading the damn questions. He was like a full novice. I was Logan. I was. I needed you here to coach me through. I was. <laughs> I was like overthinking everything. Yeah. Okay. Hey, catch some fish and uh, have a great time. Yep. Will okay. do. I'll see you. Bye, Logan. Bye. So there it is. Uh, with that, we're going to wrap up Tech Talk Taco Tuesday. Uh, you can always support us by, uh, you know, adopting a small Chihuahua. Five bucks. The, or, buy, or buying this one. Pay um, We are on, uh, you know, we have links at the bottom of our Fresh Dirt stories that go to an Amazon uh, link. If you're ever shopping for real expensive items, uh, definitely click through on that. Even if you're shopping for cheap items like Chihuahua food, um, click through mm-hmm. on that. We get a little chunk of it. Buy a T-shirt. It's up on the sign. Um, the nice shirts. Right behind us. Yeah, we have really nice shirts, and they don't do well with uh, food stains on them. But I should wear all the ones. I, I should wear some with food stains. It's almost like the stain I have on the side of my face from my helmet um, doing its job and my face hitting the ground. Uh, we need a Hawaiian print shirt. Is that what you're yeah, saying? That way you can't tell what you, what you, spilled, what you spilled on it. it. Right. Um, and thanks to everybody for joining in on our chat room that's on Facebook uh, all the time. You guys... Uh, Always have good questions and keep it interesting in there. And I will be back likely next Tuesday at the very same time. Yeah. Tech Talk Taco Tech Tuesday. Tech Talk Taco Tuesday. We'll be doing Tuesday. episode number 71. And uh, with that, we will uh, see you out on the trail. So yeah. cheers. Thanks for having me, Jimmy. Ow. Go get it. <laughs>